uh, our presenter's bio for today. Hi. Oops, sorry, Isa, that was my bad. Hi, welcome everyone. Today presenter is Luz Lopez. Um, she is a clinical professor at Boston University School of Social Work. She is also the director of the Global Health Corps at Boston University Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health and Health Associate Director of the Dual Degree Program in Social Work and Public Health. And also, Dr. Luz Lopez is part of our advisory board. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you, Isa, for presenting our speaker of the day. And before we start the presentation, Dr. Lopez wanted to share a video with everybody. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the video, which should be open. Sorry. Okay. Oops. Sorry for that. Okay, here we go. All of us to stay home, right? But what if home isn't a safe place? Domestic violence advocates say for victims, social distancing and isolation can put them at even greater risk. Investigative reporter Ali Donnelly shows us how agencies are adapting to try and keep victims safe. Just like that, on a dime, it was like he'd see red. Leah Putnam didn't leave the first time he grabbed her arm or the times he slammed her against the wall. It was after her abuser tried to strangle her, pregnant with their child, that she got out. You can go from everything's fine to the next thing you know, you're pinned down and pretty much begging for your life. I'm scared. This is a tough time. Jessica Braden heads the Domestic Violence Prevention Agency, Respond Inc. in Somerville. She and other advocates say the pandemic is putting victims in more danger. The message to stay home, coupled with financial stress, job loss, kids home from school, can trap victims and trigger abusers. If you can isolate somebody, then you have the more of an opportunity to control them. In just the last week, police say two women were killed in alleged domestic homicides on the Cape. Both men pleaded not guilty and are being held without bail. What's happening at the house there? Respond and other agencies have gotten creative to help victims with restraining orders, safety plans, shelter, and virtual support groups. Well, you know where to find me if you need anything. But several tell the NBC10 Boston investigators hotline calls are actually down. People can't get to the phone. They have no time alone to talk through a call. It's too early to tell whether domestic violence calls to police have gone up. But based on what they're seeing, advocates say the problem is getting worse. We're seeing signs of uh, strangulation, increased physical abuse. This pandemic is kind of a perfect storm. Deborah Robbins is with Jane Doe Inc. and says they're also hearing of a drop in rape kit exams. The State Department of Public Health didn't immediately return our calls, but Robbins worries sexual assault victims are staying out of hospitals to avoid being exposed to coronavirus. Yes. A serious concern because that is about evidence collection in a very timely way. It takes those who are most vulnerable and makes them more vulnerable. We've put several ways to get help on our website, but if you're in danger, call 911. Or advocates say if you can get out for a walk or to a store, you may be able to safely message someone you trust. Allie Dunley, NBC 10 Boston. Okay. Uh, changing the presenter. Edmund Wilkinship. Sorry for that. Okay. Luz, as soon as we can see the presentation, you can go ahead and start. I think we're ready to go, Luz. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to the La National Hispanic and Latino Mental Health Technology Transfer Center for this invitation. It's for me a privilege and uh, I'm so excited to share uh, my experiences and to learn also from all of your experiences too. Um, 
And um, I wanted to share that video because it was a framework to the topic today. And I want to go over the objectives that we're gonna have. Next slide. Um, recognize mental health consequences and increase in intimate partner violence due to the COVID-19, shelter in place measures, the job losses, the closing of schools, and general uncertainty that everybody is experiences. We are going to identify cultural specific coping strategies to address the disruption caused by this pandemic in the Latinx families and ways to reduce domestic violence. And we are going to review some resources and tools in Spanish and culturally adapted for people that are affected by this disease. Next slide. As we saw in the video, staying at home measures are excellent, but many homes are not safe. COVID-19 and shelter in, uh, in place measures results in, in, in more risk for intimate partner violence, child abuse, emotional stress and family conflict. Domestic violence organizations are uh, trying to solve this situation and we see an interesting trend in the country. We have some regions where um, the numbers of calls to the hotlines have increased and the numbers of reported cases of violence have certainly increased. But there are other areas and other states where the number of calls have been reduced. Um, and that is not surprising because if the uh, uh, perpetrator or the person who abused is in the home, it's very hard for the, person, the survivor to go out and be able to call. And so the numbers are going down. But this is a serious concern and it's one of the issues that we want to address today. Next slide. Um, uh, sometimes people are asking me, but what do people do? What do survivors do uh, when they are at home and, and they don't feel safe? Domestic violence deeply affects one's emotions and the person feels so confused because um, the person that they love is, uh, uh, is, is taking them out of context and children who are supposed to be protected are being put in danger as well. Um, so we have to create ways to deal with these uh, e conflicted emotions. And uh, it, but it's right now with the COVID-19 situation, it's so difficult to see how to reach these families. Next slide. Um, we know that um, the home is often the space where physical, emotional, economical, and sexual abuse occurs. And um, during this time of COVID-19, there is a more power and control situation that have come up between uh, the person who abused and the uh, survivor because the woman have been so afraid uh, to go out and the perpetrators sometimes say, if you go out, I'm going to uh, make sure that you get infected with this uh, disease <laughs> or monitors when she goes to the store or um, use other tools to control. If you talk to someone, I'm going to um, make sure the kids, something happened to the kids. So it's adding more stress to the, the survivors and the families in general. Children also are unable to express feelings and now they are removed from their school where they had resources. They don't have a teacher that they can talk to or they don't have a, 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 another family member or someone to trust. So this is increasing the number of situations of violence and also the concern for the children. Next slide. Um, the Violence Intervention Program, which is a nonprofit organization that serves uh, Latin American women, saw an increase of 35% in the number of calls in March compared to February uh, uh, last month. Um, but we know that because of COVID, the shelters are closed and it's not safe to stay there. So many states are using very innovative alternatives and are providing hotels, uh, 
hotels where survivors can stay with the children. The domestic violence shelters are coordinating and then they are using uh, creative techniques to, to communicate with the woman. And I heard one example where they told the woman to say if she was making um, an order of pizza and uh, call to, ma to make the order. And then the person said, at what time you want the pizza delivered? And that was the time that they were going to come to pick her up to bring her to the hotel. So they are using ways to try to bring information and alternative and maintain the family safe. Next slide. For Latina families, uh, familismo is very important. Um, we believe that the family is the center, uh, is the sanctity, and we have to preserve the family. So sometimes the Latinx woman decide not to share because they are afraid of the of, of picking out. They are feeling shame, they're feeling guilt, and they're feeling that they may betray their community or their family if they say something. So it's harder sometimes to share, express what is really happening. So the providers need to uh, talk and create more safety and, and um, try to engage them in conversation. Next slide. Um, however, for Latinx immigrants, there are additional complications of interpersonal violence. Some may be undocumented, and some are adapting to the culture here and have uh, acculturation differences. So this in increases the power and control tools that the person who abuse may use. They uh, may threaten the woman for uh, telling her that they are going to call the immigration uh, or the deportation agency if they say something of what is happening. Or sometimes, um, they say you don't know the language and you don't know the law here so um, you have to do what i say and give misinformation sometimes also the cultural background of the person uh, uh, impacts how she communicates their uh, feelings and emotions and uh, the, the provider has to be aware of the subtle subtle cues that she may give not necessarily verbally, but non-verbally, about what is happening in the home. Next slide. Um, sometimes the, the immigrant woman and Latina woman may be um, threatened uh, in non-traditional ways or, or culturally specific ways that are not common in mainstream United States like slapping with the shoes in the Islamic culture and in our culture, in Latino culture, we have la chancleta. Uh, mothers and grandmothers sometimes or fathers who, who throw la chancleta and it's a form of uh, abuse, sometimes depending on how hard the chancleta is thrown, right? Um, but these things are not so common in, in other cultures. And um, there, that's a subtle example, but there may be other examples of ways that uh, the abuser is using language or uh, the culture to oppress more the survivor. And then they make this less likely that the person will reach out for help. Next slide. Interpersonal uh, violence also affects, um, as I said, uh, the limited communication tools and the support system that the woman may have. It also, in, uh, there is a disparity in the access to resources, for example, health insurance, and it is used also as a tool to scare the person. If you get infected, um, we don't have health insurance or we have limited insurance, or the person that is abusing takes the health insurance cards away, and say, you know, that our kids will be in danger or the kids will be in danger and uses that um, to oppress the woman. They also uh, offer scare tactics. Uh, so when the woman goes out, if she's the one that is doing the groceries or communicating with neighbors, um, she's forced not to share this information. 
and uh, the kids again are at home witnessing this situation. Next slide. Many communities, however, are implementing creating solutions. And we know that so many of you who are listening are using telehealth technology and other digital platforms to provide the services that the families need. And these can be very effective tools to share with the survivors and to connect with them and with the children as well. We know teachers are connecting with their students or uh, the, the clinic, clinicians also can help stu uh, young children and any, any child. Um, however, sometimes these telehealth uh, tools have to be taken with caution because during the, the session or the conversation, the perpetrator may be there. So we have to be really careful about how we ask the questions, what questions are asked, and how the woman and the survivor is sharing the information because it could increase the risk for, the, for her and for the children. So it's a balancing act of using the tool, sometimes observing uh, what is around, but also in that observation, being aware that there may be cultural differences. For example, you may see the, the child playing in the background or another sibling, and um, they may be more open to talk or, or to participate <laughs> during the session. They come in um, and uh, engage them, but always cautious of what information they are sharing. One, to help them, but also making sure that no other person is listening and it could be at risk. Next slide. This is a, a resource that the National Traumatic Child Stress Network developed recently and it's called Trinka and Sam Fighting the Dyros and it's a tool to talk to children about the, what is happening with COVID-19 and, and the fears and the um, anxiety that they may have and it provides tools for them. I have an example of another page of that book. Next slide. Um, they have uh, Sam, uh, who is one of the, the mouths in the story, and they say sometimes the growing hawks were mad at each other they, uh, and they were observing, and this is because they are in, in quarantine inside and all the children are playing around and the parents got so stressed that they started fighting and the kids are observing the situation. So the book talks about situations and the grief that the children may experience by witnessing violence or sometimes um, because they miss the kids at school or because they, are, they cannot go to the playground. So it's a tool for them to express emotions, um, but also to talk about what's happening in the house. And it's a tool that provides school use. And that tool is being translated and it will be available in Spanish as well. Um, next slide. Sometimes we have slangs or sayings that we say in Latino culture, in Puerto Rico and in other countries. And this one says, ojos que no ven, corazón que no sienten. Um, and so, sometimes kids have, have so much inside and there are ways to, to, to talk to them about what's happening. Um, and right now, we, we are going to use an example in a few minutes of a way that a tool was used to connect with the children. Next slide. We also have to take in consideration the stigma that the family may experience um, for, um, for being in this situation. And we have another saying, los trapos sucios se lavan en casa. Um, so that uh, means that um, we, people are not so open to share because there are cultural taboos and, um, and people feel pressure to, to maintain that. At the same time, we can reach out as providers. Next slide. So now I, I want to invite two special guests um, that are here with me today. And we are going to have a, some conversation about this topic and how we can engage the children and the family. And the first one is 
a colleague and young friend and mentor uh, from Puerto Rico. Her name is Carmen Morales. She's going to come in. And the other one, her name is Carmen too. And uh, she is a colleague, a very respected colleague um, that I admire. And who I, we have been collaborating in several projects. And she is the uh, a child trauma clinical service specialist and training lead at the Boston Medical Center. And she's going to come in as well. She's also a trainer. I have done trainers. Um, her name is Carmen Rosa Noronha. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm working on the uh, details here so that I can let them show their webcam and open their microphone. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> okay, we have within uh -huh. one Carmen. Yes. <laughs> Hola. Hola. The two Carmen's are here. And I want to start with Carmen Morales um, because she shared with me an experience that she had with her three year old grandchild. And when we were talking, I realized that it, it was a perfect example of what children can be experiencing right now with this uh, pandemic situation. Okay, hi, I am Carmen Morales and I came four years ago because I became a grandmother, which is awesome. My daughter, um, she told me that last week she, we, we, she got an anecdote with her son. And then she noticed that he was very sad. And well, she addressed the situation and says, Alexander, um, are you sad? Uh, you look sad so are you uh, and he said yes i am very sad and then she answered why is that so well all my toys are sick what all your toys are sick so and why are they sick because they got coronavirus and now i cannot play with them oh boy but she addressed immediately and asked, could you do something about this situation? And the kid looked at her and thought, yes, I can. I can give some medicine to the toys. Okay, pues let's do that. So there are some Lego sticks that are very colorful, to me are new and that you break it in little pieces and those little pieces he gave uh each of the toys by mouth by by the way the toys were dragons so he put it in here in each dragon's mouth the medicine which was the the little sticks and then uh mother you know my daughter asked what well, what happened mom they are all cure they got their medi medicine so now i can play with them so this is you know just a little example and everything went to normal and they kept living happily ever after <laughs> um, I thought this example was uh, uh, very appropriate because he's three years old and he's talking about the toys and it may be, but in reality, he, the child may have some worry, some anxiety, some feelings that at that age they cannot express. Um, the father goes out to work and he has to put a mask and they see the child sees that and I know the parents talk to the kids about that situation but they can use play to connect and ask questions and express how they feel. And now I am so honored that Carmen Rosa is here uh, because she's an expert working in this field and working with play therapy and other areas, and I want to invite her to share to her experience. 
And, you, and one Lou. moment before you start, I wanted to tell people that you can move the camera if the square is very small, you can make it bigger. Uh, and so you can see us um, in the conversation. Okay. Thank you, Luz. Yes, I work at the Child Witness to Violence Project at Boston Medical Center, and we provide uh, services, counseling, and outreach services to children birth to eight and their caregivers when there have been um, issues of domestic violence and, and community violence, and also the children or their uh, non-offending parents have experienced other types of trauma. And we use basically play because uh, little children cannot express with words their fears or concerns, but they express them through their behavior. So they might be acting up or becoming aggressive or extremely sad, or they become very clingy or they might regress. Uh, they might start uh, wetting the bed or um, presenting behaviors that were not uh, present before. And uh, when there is a domestic violence, as Luz was pointing out, there is a loss for the child because uh, on one hand, uh, the parents who, or the parents who are supposed to protect cannot protect because one is, uh, might be extremely afraid and vulnerable. And then the other one becomes uh, in, in their eyes, a very scary figure in that uh, takes away any sense of, of safety or um, in many times children want to protect their parents. So we use play and, and then Carmen was giving this beautiful example of this mom who is very in intuitive and then she uses the opportunity to, to help uh, her child to talk about her the fears and and then to recover from some of those fears like uh, it she provides some meaning some words to feelings and then also a solution right or a resolution to a question or a concern that the child has so in in this example this this child has a very resourceful parent and um, for many of our um, caregivers, they are e extremely uh, concerned or they have experienced trauma for a very, very long time. So they might not have that emotional capacity or ability to read their children's skills. So our job is to use the relationship, so that rela relationship with the parent to help them to become the protective figure to, be, to help them to, uh, through play, to tell a story or to answer some of the questions that the children might have or and to dissipate some of their anxieties and, and fears. And that is a way of restoring the relationship, particularly when there has been domestic violence and, and shame, uh, as, as Lou was mentioning. Yes, um, I think the validation of feelings is so important. Another challenge mm -hmm. that we mentioned when we were talking is families that are um, undocumented or immigrant families and the challenges they experience during this COVID-19 situation. And if you can share also your experience about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my work has focused uh, with particularly with Latin American families, many of whom are mixed out families and undocumented families, and, and we we um, have the the privilege of serving uh, families who are immigrant families because we are we don't have to be here for services, so we have that opportunity, and uh, so some of the the themes that have come up are um the the inability of, of how difficult it has been for these families to ob observe social um distancing because they they need to go to work uh, uh, because if they don't work there there is no access to additional funding or um uh, uh, any kind of uh, security net so um so these parents have to go to work then um, Luz was mentioning the issue of uh, telehealth, 
and telehealth has been a, a great opportunity, but then also it has, uh, we have learned how to um, understand what is the situation, the financial situation for the family and if they have access or not to the internet, uh, maybe they have limited uh, minutes in their cell phone just to make emergency calls. So we had to identify first what were their their needs before we could offer telehealth. And then also to be very clear about uh, issues of confidentiality um, when you use telehealth and Luz was also also mentioning um, the discussion about asking uh, questions specifically around safety because we don't know, especially for undocumented women, if the uh, abuser is in the home, as many times they have to depend on that person to for survival. So um, we also we have learned so, so many lessons about uh, resiliency and. In creativity, I was sharing with Luz that um, you know, I was working with, with a mom uh, who uh, they don't have a lot of means. Uh, the fam members of the family are, are undo undocumented and they didn't have an access to um, a computer. So, uh, you know, like I gave her some information about uh, places where she could um, find a, a laptop through the school and also food and, and she was um she said just send me the link in spanish and then she used uh, her phone and uh, she moved very quickly and she was able to get all these resources for her uh children and um and so that that was um so interesting for me uh and not surprising that you know, our families are, are very resourceful and they can do a lot with very little and when you give them support and, and, and uh, some uh, guidance in terms of how to use resources. One of the uh, tools that I learned about is that some phone companies are offering uh, free uh, internet data or increasing the level of data for families for free. So it's something that you can explore so they can have access to the phone or they can have access to more internet uh, for WhatsApp or for telehealth or for, and uh, you can uh, explore in your in your state and because also domestic violence shelters and hotlines have uh, made partnership with some of these uh, phone companies to uh, help these families and make the, the the phone um, so they don't have the expense of the phone but you are talking about disparities uh, our latino families have to work uh continue to work documented and undocumented both all the families sometimes are working in in jobs um low paid jobs um in the grocery stores working still in the stores or cleaning buildings or working in uh, in the um, nursing homes. So they are more at risk for the virus um, than others. And also they because they have to work, they have a dilemma now that the kids are at home and we worry about those children that either are left alone or are left alone with all their children um, because there is no choice. <laughs> the family have to keep going. So we have to talk about the disparities too on, of the shelter in place um, mm -hmm. measures and not assume that everybody can do the same and that it's wonderful. Um, you, there are challenges, but at the same time, they are creative tools that we can use to connect. And one of the strengths of the Latino community is the collective way that we, we approach situations and um, sometimes we do have a village of people that can help that can come but now they cannot just come over right <laughs> i have a friend who stay in quarantine for 14 days uh, with her child so she can then bring her children safe um, because they didn't have symptoms um, to the care of her sister and her sister did this, did the same. <laughs> she stayed at home 14 days, not going anywhere. So they could share that experience and help each other. Um, 
but some people need to look for other resources. Um, Luz, one of the one of the things that I wanted to to mention that has come up too, and that I think is is important for everyone to be thinking about is particularly if the, the parent, particularly for our Latin American families and families who are um, undocumented or, or immigrants, is if the parent gets ill and there is no other safe care, caregiver or no other caregiver, uh, like, a, you know, another parent, uh, what are some of the, what is some of the planning that can happen so the child doesn't have to end up in um, the state's custody. So we have uh, begun to use, uh, we, we developed a family preparedness plan uh, in the case of separation due to the uh, rela uh, detention related to immigration, but we have adapted that plan to help uh, care caregivers uh, and parents to start to, to think about who would you leave your child with if you are so ill uh, that you cannot take care of them. And so just, you know, thinking about, like Lou was saying, um, you know, who in your community uh, can you identify as a safe person? And then um, and then we have, uh, because now there is some, uh, at least in Massachusetts, there there is some flexibility to use an affidavit and to complete it um, uh, uh, without a, a notary necessarily, especially if the parent is ill, um, and how to use those documents to help um, uh, to empower parents to make a decision about uh, about who will take temporarily care of their children. So this is a, a theme also that has has come up: the concern about where is my child going to be if I am very very ill. And that's really so important for single moms or or parents that are alone here with many children. And if they get ill, and as I say, there is a chance because they're working in, in risky environments, what's going to happen with the children? So the Carmen and her team at Boston Medical Center has been preparing this, this uh, resource, which I thought is so important because um, it, it prepares a, a plan and identi identifies people and also give them a number and they give them number to the child as well. Or if the child is very small, they tape it or put it in their clothes or they put it in their room. So when the person is gonna come to find them, um, they, they can uh, look for them um, and, and find those resources. Um, and the other challenge is that, as we know, families are, cannot come to the hospital to visit. So this needs to be in place because there may be no more access to the information when the, once the person is ill. Um, so I wanna thank you both for being here for your time <laughs> today. And I think we are going to open up for questions um, for, for us. <laughs> okay, let me go through. Um, we have already some questions. Oh, thank you, Carmen and Carmen. for <laughs> <laughs> starting with questions. Um, Okay, let's see. Okay, the first question says, how often are children's responses of stress due to COVID-19 dismissed or misinterpreted due to upholding machismo within the parent-child relationship? Interesting question uh, because um, I think uh, children learn very young the cues, <laughs> and I think it's very important to encourage both boys and girls that it's okay to express feelings, that it's okay to be scared, that it's okay to ask questions. And some parents in the culture sometimes say, you have to be tough, kids don't cry or don't be scared, or everything is gonna be fine. Um, but, he, but we need to allow the, the room for the kids to express feelings, and also for the adults to express feelings, um, male or female or any gender. Um, 
they need to to we need to I also was talking to another colleague who told me we we asked and how you are and people say we are all okay we are hanging in there we are great but um, we need to talk about the challenges that it is not always okay that we are in a process of grief grief uh, of the things that we cannot do and especially as a Latino community we are all in a process of grief of the collective experience of seeing each other of hugging each other of seeing each other um, and that uh, is, is being stopped right now so the kid may be expressing the feeling and um, with COVID or with domestic violence it's very important that we give the space so the person um, can can um, uh, uh, the kid can express the feeling and the adult allow that that is okay and uh, for the child. And one, uh, I think that a great way of um, of facilitating maybe those messages is uh, through books and, and uh, Luz was mentioning the Trinca and some book that the Spanish version is called Trinca and Juan and um, I had the pleasure of helping translate it into Spanish and in that book, um, so there are there are little boys and girls represented by mice, and uh, they are expressing a lot of feelings. And then there is a father also who says at one point that they are scared. So without necessarily contradicting maybe the the, the father or the males in in the family, these are ways uh, in which we can um, send a message that is okay to. Well, that is very important to express uh, feelings for boys and girls and, and uh, for all genders. You have another question? I yes. know that Carmen, Carmen Morales has it. We're done. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you guys were done. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question. It says, I work with an, an, I don't know if that's, I think this is misspelled, an accommodated immigrant children. Oh, and it says between um, parentheses on a shelter. And it's very difficult to make them understand the consequences of COVID and they keep re refusing telehealth services. Is there any resources that we can use for that? I know this is something new for everyone and we had to assign session on site with PPE equipment as they refuse remote services. I think um, in some agencies, um, we they, they use the telephone, uh, the regular telephone to to talk and provide the resources um, because they they are people are afraid of telehealth and where is the information going? Um, well, who's going to see me if this is going to be recorded? Um, so they are afraid of all that. So um, they're trying to use um, telehealth. I know Carmen Morales has another uh, appointment. So I want to thank you for being here. And I think Cindy, yeah, uh, we are going to stay with Carmen Rosa <laughs> for the end of the for the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. Do you have another another uh, thought on the on the uh, alternative? Yeah. Tools? <laughs> yeah. I I think that um, that you know my my thought is like I, I um, I'm wondering why why are they not wanting to use telehealth uh, and you are mentioning some very valid and important reasons for for why uh, they might not want to be on on camera um in our program we have had a lot of success um using the phone and uh that has been like a, a that has been a good compromise between you know like face-to-face -face, uh, work and, uh, and using a video and some families have preferred that. So I am wondering if giving families some choices within the telehealth, if that 
could uh, facilitate engagement um, and, and understanding where the the fears or concerns are are coming from. Um, mm -hmm. Also, may, sometimes meeting outside in the distance, uh, meeting the person um, in a in a empty space and sitting far from each other and uh, talking that way, but that is more difficult uh, at times. Um, uh, Luz, someone is asking about, oh, I just missed it. The book you mentioned, I had the question, but I don't know why I just missed it here. And uh -huh. she mentioned the title, I think it was Tina something. And and they're asking where can they get it and if they can print it, like if, if there's accessibility to it, like right now. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, there is accessibility in English right now at the at the website of the National Traumatic Child Stress Network. And you have in front of you one of the person who is helping to translate it. So Carmen is doing the translation in Spanish and, and she's going to tell you where it's available in Spanish or when it's going to be available. It is already up in Spanish and, and it's available from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and uh, uh, also in, in that uh, site, you can find many, many resources particularly for young uh, children. And then there is a whole section for families, providers, uh, in a section in English and in Spanish. And uh, this uh, book has uh, many other versions uh, with different um, natural disasters. So uh, there is a, a version for earthquakes, a version for tornadoes. And uh, it has a parent, uh, a, a guide for the parents, and then a workbook. There is also a poster with feelings in the in the story. That is a story that you can color with with the child, and uh, and with the and, or the parents can color with the child. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I think someone, maybe it was the same person that asked the question, said that. Uh, uh, answering to the question you you asked before about why they didn't want telehealth, um, uh, I don't know therapy. I would say um, they said that they want face to face interaction, and in Spanish they say no quiero hablar con gente por una pantalla. Uh huh. Okay. Which is a, a very important and valid cultural concern. We are used to the the human interaction, the physical interaction. And um, it, it, this is really hard. And it's really hard for, for both adults and children. And culturally, we may be able to find ways to have um, a distance. But for example, I was visiting uh, an aunt uh, and she 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 wanted to hug me. She wanted, I, you know, even though we're supposed to be far and she's an elderly person. Uh, this is too hard, and sometimes we question, you know, is the prevention for the virus is going to emotionally affect more in the long run for especially elderly members of the family uh, um, or other members who feel isolated, and we need that human touch. Um, but what we are doing is trying to be creative and meeting the distance and then um, connect, say, well, we cannot, uh, but in the camera, at least we can see each other and um, we can connect and listen to you. Sometimes in the phone, even though you're not seeing the person, you can hear better the feelings and connect with that person. But it's, it's a reality and it's hard. Um, the, culturally, this is uh, so against our, our collective and human uh, connections that we are used to. Yeah, and somebody else shared that um, she's doing calls instead of telehealth and in terms of video, I think, because they don't like it and they prefer in person. So that's like, I guess, a middle ground that they found. Yes. Um, 
but at the same time uh the phone sometimes is good but sometimes um encouraging the person to to try it out to try the the camera may be helpful to see this to see the person and their feelings and the those nonverbal cues it's, it's a balancing act um the other part is that not everybody has a computer or an ipad <laughs> uh, or they can see themselves in the on the phone with whatsapp or other tools um and then when possible uh, going for a walk in the distance or doing exercise or listening to a song um uh, finding ways to to connect or have the children play, play together that could be a solution and especially for children who are uh, stressed due to the um the stress in the home is very important that we find uh, alternative ways to connect with them and do play and exercise and music that you can do with the, the phone or the camera. <laughs> Thank you, Luz. Um, I don't want to extend this because I know some people have to go. So I'm going to um, give you guys one more question. Um, it says, I find that victims are scared of financial stress and of deportation when they think about doing a report of domestic violence. Is there any book or other guide to help the victim to have an idea of what to do and what is going to happen so that they know ahead of time what to expect when they finally have the courage to take the steps and stop the abuse? I think, uh, Carmen, you have a wonderful tool. <laughs> so I, I think that um, there are so, so there are several things that that uh, a, the person can do. Um, usually, uh, a domestic violence advocate, or for instance, in our hospital, we have a department uh, that is called safety and support. So that could be a first step to have a number to one of these persons who can answer the questions about immigration, whether or not it's safe, when it's safe, and to include those um, those uh, questions in, in terms of making a decision and uh, how and if you decide to leave, where you can go, because those are very valid questions depending on which part of the country you are. Um, it, here in Massachusetts, if, if there is an incident of domestic violence and you call 911, uh, the, the police uh, will protect the, 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 the survivor or the victim and, um, and you know, like there is, uh, there could be reassurance that they would not be deported. They, uh, however, uh, the abuser uh, might get deported so that sometimes is uh, a concern for many families that they don't call the police because that would mean that the abuser is going to get arrested and that if that person is undocumented they would definitely get deported and there is uh, i can share a resource of some uh, information for for immigrants uh, on the on the process and and the law we have some um, printed material that I can share. And I know this this webinar will be available and we can we can include that. Thank yes, you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Luz. Yes, the webinar is usually available more or less seven days after the live session on our YouTube channel. And I also wanted to remind everybody because I saw some questions here about the certificate of participation you should be receiving that this afternoon um, the system generates them so uh, you'll definitely get it on your email as well as our survey link and it is very important that everybody fills um, that survey because that's what keeps us uh, doing this great work and giving you more webinars and interesting topics on the Hispanic and Latino community I want to thank once again Luz and Carmen for giving us such great information. Um, we've been getting great feedback on the question um, tool here. So I'll be sharing that with both of you um, later on. 
And I know we had some unanswered questions, so um, anyone can feel free to email us and we'll definitely try to answer every question that we got uh, and we'll send it to our speaker as well. And as far as um, handouts, you have it on the platform. If by any reason you cannot download it, um, if you could not download the, the presentation, again, write us an email and I'll attach it to, to the reply so that way it's easier for you guys. Um, I mean, I mean, for now, once again, thank you to our presenters for the afternoon and thank you everybody who's been here with us. I don't know, Lucy, if you want to say something else before we go. Yeah, no, I wanted to thank Carmen again and thank you, the team, for this opportunity and everybody that took this time to be with us this afternoon. And uh, there are other yes. seminar webinars that you are having. So now uh, I encourage people to attend the others. Thank you so much. Thank Buenas you for tarde. inviting me, Lu. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Gracias. Very good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.